explain how such a scheme would be established and how it would operate in practice. Yes, absolutely. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting um, ICAS along today. Um, ICAS operates a fairly comprehensive um, regulatory approach for its members. Um, we also have uh, situations where we have our CA firms comprising of not only CAs, but non-members. Now, in order to bring those non-members into the regulatory structure, they can become a, a regulated non-member. So what that means is it's a contractual arrangement whereby non-members come into the regulatory four. Now that has the advantage of that we can actually go out to firms and monitor the whole firm as opposed to just looking at our members. So we're actually bringing in non-members into the regulatory um, framework. It's a simple way of doing it. It means that we can go out and assess the firm for quality and competence. And um, it is certainly something that has worked well for the accountancy profession. Anything to add, Ms Barber? Uh, not really. I mean, the criteria for being a regulated non-member is that you are a fit and proper person and that you've, you agree to be bound by all the ICAS rules and regulations and, of course, whilst you're not a chartered accountant, it does allow that person to become a principal in a firm of chartered accountants. Firms of chartered accountants must have at least 50% principals who are chartered accountants. So a lawyer could come in as far as our rules are concerned. I uh, appreciate that, as yet, the Law Society rules wouldn't permit that. Ex-inspectors, members from the Institute of Tax, those kind of people are often regulated non-members. Thank you. Now, well continue along the theme of regulation um, and could ask you whether or not you feel that the further safeguards such as a, an enhanced role for the Lord President of the Court of Session or a consumer panel established by statute would provide a reassurance in preserving the independence of the legal profession, Ms Muir. Um, I have no real strong views on that. Obviously, ICAS is um, role with this bill is fairly limited in terms of um, an interest in an alternative business structure or confirmation services. Um, I certainly would not be opposed to that type of arrangement. Barbara? Uh, I don't have anything really to add to that. Thank you. Now proceed with our questioning through Cathy Craigie. Could I just follow on a question um, from yourself? Um, I think, good morning. I think it was um, Charlotte Barber that, um, that, that told us here just now that 50% um, of um, partners in, a, in a, a regulated firm must be CAs. Yes. Um, could you give us um, some idea about, uh, expand a wee bit um, on the, the types of people who apply to be um, uh, non-member uh, regulated uh, firms? Y yes. Uh, in the main, most firms of chartered accountants consist of chartered accountants, and they might be from our institute, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. Equally, they could be from other institutes of chartered accountants. We also tend to have, quite often, I think it's in the tax world, maybe members who are of the Institute of Tax might be applied to be a regulated non-member. Sometimes ex-inspectors of tax might be regulated non-members. Uh, it tends to be other people who, who work in the professional fields but maybe don't have quite the same regulatory structure uh, and they would also want to be able to be a full partner in a firm of chartered accountants. And is it people who are generally working in accountancy in some way who, who tend well, to be... Uh, that, that's quite an interesting question because in some respects accountancy firms are almost like MDPs, multidisciplinary practices already because uh, a chartered accountant might be doing accountancy, uh, audits slightly different because it's in a, in, in a regulated sector uh, and so you need extra qualifications and licenses for that. It might be insolvency, it could be tax, it could be corporate finance. So there's quite a range of services provided already. And in actual fact, one of the things that's of interest to us in this bill is that our members already provide quite a lot of legal services, tax advice, that kind of thing. Okay. And why was it fe felt necessary to say that 50% of the partners must be CAs? I think we would want control. Okay. I've got a point on this. 
Thank you very much, Convener. I'm just wondering whether you could elaborate, please, on the, the kind of problems that having lawyers, if I may say, doing law rather than doing tax, if I may use those very simple descriptions, surely they, they, would, they would cause problems in regulatory terms, which your scheme simply doesn't cover, I would suggest. I mean, I think it would depend on how the whole regulatory approach works. I mean, certainly from our point of view, um, we're in, fa in favour of this bill, but the bill will really, the success of it will really be dependent on the regulatory approach. Now, if we can build in um, the, our existing processes into a regulatory approach for these types of licensed providers, then that will be effective and it will be cost effective. Um, we will have to enter into some form of memorandum of understanding with other professions to understand where we have to work together and share information, for example. Um, but all will be dependent on what our obligations are as an approved regulator and what actually regulation we have to carry out. If that is at a fairly high level, and in some ways we carry out that already with our firms, then having lawyers within um, a regulated structure in one entity will not create difficulties. Right. I, guess, I guess where I'm coming from on this is, is there seem to be two approaches to yourselves being regulators in the context of this bill. One is that you, if I may put it this way, modify your existing scheme to accommodate the requirements of this. The alternative is that you actually say, look, our existing scheme with a few tweaks is actually good enough. You don't need all of this. Now, what you've just said implies to me that you see the former as being the better route, that you recognize you've got a scheme. It, it wouldn't be compliant with this. It doesn't deal with, in particular with the, the confidentiality issues um, and the conflict of interest issues that lawyers are going to meet. And therefore, if I've heard you were right, you're not suggesting that your scheme would be fine and we don't need this bill. What you're suggesting is that your scheme would be a good one on which to build, given whatever framework this yeah, bill provides. That's absolutely what we're suggesting. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Thank you. Just so we could put this one to bed, um, what test does ICAS apply with regard to non-members, non-accountant members, <coughs> insofar as the definition of a fit and proper person is concerned? That's very rigorous. I mean, we have a fairly rigorous application process um, and we can certainly leave the details off it. It covers financial integrity and reliability, um, previous convictions or civil liabilities, reputation and character, um, and you also have to obtain references as well. And what, what, what is that you're reading from? <coughs> this is the actual application for a regulated non-member. It might be helpful if we had a copy of yeah, that. Sure, no Thank you. Cathy Craig, please. Um, yeah, again, and sorry to keep coming back to you, uh, Charlotte, that um, when, when I asked you about why you thought it was an important to have 50 per cent CAs um, in a partnership, but it was because you wanted to you know, keep control. Um, this uh, bill does not set any um, level like that for um, solicitors uh, firms. Do you think that would be appropriate? Well, I suppose when I'm looking at it from the point of view of firms of chartered accountants and, and what drives that bit of the rules is whether you can actually promote yourself, designate yourself as a firm of chartered accountants. And we wouldn't want, say, a firm to be about that maybe had only one out of four principles as a CA. You would, you know, if you're going to brand yourself as a firm of chartered accountants, you would want to know that they were in the majority, or at least 50%, I think. Uh, and equally, one of, you know, that touches on one of the points that we've made in our submission about whether it would be a legal services provider, because the way the bill is currently structured at the moment, say you had three chartered accountants and one lawyer, you would need to call them a firm of legal service providers, and I'm not sure that's necessarily what our members would want. Uh, and, and that's where the interaction with our regulated non-member type model, you, you know, if we tweak the two, we might get something closer to either legal services providers, which are the majority lawyers and an accountant or a surveyor or whoever, or you could have a firm of accountants and a change in the law society rules, arguably, that would allow one or two solicitors to join our firms. 
Thank is you. Is that sensible? All right. It's, it's, um, it's a point that I think will we'll bear in mind as we uh -huh. go through um, the, 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 the report on, on this bill. Um, if I could move on a bit now, and in uh, your uh, response or your written submission to the, uh, the committee,